union, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense anymore. So the need for additional resources for the financial, for financiation of uh, productive investments and European public goods is only more acute, only more intense every day, the more and more so. Even the, uh, the, the, the president of the European Central Bank, Mr. Draghi, has announced some days ago the latest round of so-called unconventional monetary measures, bringing quantitative expansion to close to 1.6 billion euros, acknowledging that in the past four years, the weak economic growth that we have been experiencing in Europe has been the result of monetary policy alone, alone, with no fiscal resources mobilized to achieve the goals. So it's not surprising, because there is a conservative majority across the European Union in every institution. That is the case in the Council, of course, so only too obvious, but it's also in the Commission. And here in the European Parliament, we shouldn't lose sight of how, how, how uh, uh, replicated is that conservative majority also in this European Parliament's House, imposing a restrictive vision of the so-called fiscal adjustment to both national and European level. So certainly, there has not been any such thing as a counter-cyclical police of whatever nature. Simply not. No counter-cyclical measures, no counter-cyclical policy to complement the uh, actions being taken by the European Central Bank. And that is uh, why now we need a pro-growth fiscal policy at the European level in order to get the, uh, the economy and the, uh, and the uh, I would even say, the self-esteem of the European Union back to life, S reaching out for sustainable development. Uh, basic needs of the citizenship are also to be met, including care, for millions of refugees fleeing from despair, <coughs> war, and terror in the European neighborhood. And uh, of course, uh, fleeing from massive uh, human rights violations. So once again, instead of increasing the European budget or endowing the European fiscal strategy with new own resources, such as the financial fund, the transaction tax, or carbon taxes, for that matter, uh, or other resources that I, that I heard of just today here around the table that could be subject to the imagination and political will, which should be at our disposal in order to, 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 to meet the needs of the present situation. Uh, we are supposed to, to uh, to be simply watching uh, the transfer of money from budget lines to another budget lines. This is why this petition is so timely. This is why this petition is, 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 is so much handy, precisely in this particular year, 2016, in which we are supposed to be reviewing the multi-annual financial framework. This is why a great opportunity for the European Parliament to ask for a higher European Union budget and a true investment plan for job creation and sustainable development in the New Deal for Europe. So, let me conclude by, 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 by making Gianni Vitella's remark my own. The challenge before the European Union is now existential, is of the essence. We have never seen anything like it. The European Union could be waning, could be fading away before our very eyes in the coming years if we do not something about it. If the European Union does not deliver jobs and prosperity, if the European Union does not renew its narrative and promise for the coming generations, for the young, if the European Union keeps losing support for the working classes and the impoverished middle classes, 
And if the European Union is not capable of meeting the, uh, the, the, the promise of European integration and cohesion before these uh, humanitarian challenges we happen to be dealing with by now, we will keep losing ground. And uh, we, we, we just, we're just seeing it happening in every member state's internal elections. After election, populism's on the rise. We've just seen it in Germany, didn't we? With alternative for Deutschland, uh, with with uh, results uh, that would be impossible to foresee just some years ago. But it's happening once again in in in, in the in the in this core country for the whole the European uh, idea, as it is the case of of uh, union and, uh, and, and we will see anti-immigrant rhetorics, anti-euro and in the end anti-european europhobes discourses on the rise. We should fight back, we should counter attack, we should, we should, we really should stand up for a fight, we should not allow that to happen anymore and uh, in so far as we are here up for a fight for a better future for the European people, I thank you for the discussion we've just had. I thank you for being here. And I, 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 I really appreciate all of the contributions that have been shared with each and every one of us. On behalf of my colleague, co-hoster Jorlainen, and the rest of the members of the SMD group involved in this initiative to support your your, your endeavor and your will to be of service to the European Union at this particular juncture. The most harsh and difficult we'll ever see. Thank you. <laughs> now I'll give the floor to Eddie Schlein, which has uh, joined us uh, just now, owing to a concomitant uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was here in the beginning and then I had to go. I'm sorry I had another meeting. Uh, but uh, let me just say very briefly that I very much welcome the, pros the prosecution of our battle on the New Deal uh, for Europe. Um, I was strongly supporting the uh, ECI in the first place because it was what we needed, actually. It was a strong call for um, a deep rethinking of our uh, actual policies in a, in a way that uh, was trying to boost uh, new public investment with own resources. Uh, when Fernando just said how much important it, uh, it is, and I heard Gianni Pitella say the same thing at the beginning of our meeting today. Um, talking about uh, the, the, uh, the need to invest in the things that we have left behind with the crisis, if you think about it. That means that we need to, as you see uh, there, to invest in a sustainable development. It means no business as usual. It means that we have to invest on research and innovation, which were totally left behind during the crisis. And also, of course, in culture, that I think is very important. We come from a country where we were told for a lot of time that with culture you don't eat. It's not true, and in the meantime, we have actually eaten our culture. So, we have already discussed, and also today I heard uh, the introduction from uh, President Lucio Levi, uh, all the limits of the Juncker plan. So I'm not going to go back on, on that issue, but I think that we just need a deep change of perspective. And we need uh, to be able to rethink our models starting from the discussion. Mario Monti was here in this house a couple of months ago telling us about the, war, the ongoing work that they're doing on the issue of, uh, on the issue of uh, uh, own resources. We have to push the debate on FTT and on the carbon tax effort because it's not over and the discussion is still ongoing between the governments. But listening to President uh, Levy intervention, I completely agree with it. Why are we facing the crisis of the Union today? Uh, I think that the citizen needs to, need to rediscover uh, what the Union is able to do for them in their everyday life. And to do that, we need to work uh, on the social dimension of Europe, 
which was left behind. We heard Juncker committing very clearly at the start of his mandate on the triple A on social issues, the Europe on, uh, with the triple A on social issues, but still we don't see it coming. That's the truth, and I'm worried, I want to share with you my worries, uh, that the Brexit debate is actually uh, hiding that part even more, hiding the discussion on the social dimension that we need more than ever today to show to the citizen and to remember them why we have built the union, actually. It was to give more opportunities to the next generation, not less. So I think there is a thin line connecting all the big challenges on which uh, the future of our union, let me say very sadly, is actually at stake today. Um, the lack of harmonization, for example, no, let me start with this. The lack of a common foreign policy. You remember when Kissinger said, uh, I don't know what, who I have to talk with when I have to talk with Europe. It's very cynical, but it's very, I mean, today it's undeniable that we still have 28 different voices that is making us weaker on an international level. And we still lack that strong and only voice that we need in order to be, to, of course, to count more you know, the international crisis that we are facing. Uh, the lack of harmonization at the fiscal level is another problem. Um, we still have 28 very different uh, fiscal system in which many companies are actually profiting from these differences. Uh, you have known about the Lux uh, Luxembourg scandals, but it's not only about Luxembourg. Many other countries do the same thing, actually. So the problem is, we cannot let this happen in a union. How is it possible? I, I met some workers that were actually losing the jobs in front of a factory in Italy, and I was talking to them, and they told me, you know, they don't tell us that we're losing the job tomorrow. They say, if you want to continue work, you have to follow the factory in Poland. For pro-Europeans like me, like us, it's very difficult to explain to them why we have made up the union, why we have, we have wanted the union. We didn't want it to see extreme competition, fiscal competition among the member states who belong to the same union. That is simply impossible and unacceptable. So we have to work on that as well. And then, of course, the lack of a critical ana analysis of where the economic and social policies of the last years have brought us the Greece situation, uh, is another problem. We have to face it. These policies, focusing only on austerity, or mainly on austerity, are actually not working. Without public, public investment, without, uh, of course, an intervention to try to change that model of development that we, are, uh, we have been using, and that, have, that has shown in these years uh, the failure, the total failure of these policies. So, Last thing, last but not least, the migration crisis. Once again, the, the refusal uh, to find a common European solution, which is the only one that can help us face the situation, and the refusal to better distribute the responsibilities among the member states. Let's remember it. Article 78 and 80 of the treaty openly say that we need solidarity and equal share of responsibility between member states. Are we seeing that? Not yet. And as a law student, let me say, if we are not implementing the article of the treaties, we are violating them. So that's another point. The thin line, and I'm concluding now, uh, the thin line that connects all these important challenges that we're facing, that, that, that will define the future of our union, is the selfishness in which, unfortunately, the European government have closed themselves, which is even stronger as, an, uh, as a result of the political crisis of the Union, you remember the whole discussion about the Constitution, the European Constitution, uh, has just met together with the economic and, and, and uh, of course, financial crisis. And in this, the selfishness of the government and the